I I did all this work with the federal commissioners and got Bell County exposed for trafficking children. Like there's there's no question. It's a 45 page report of trafficking kids. So I, I felt like it really guilty for celebrating that I could prove it was happening. Like that felt terrible to me. But I was actually celebrating that I saw I could get the community's eyes wide open. And that is not what happened. Nothing changed. Yeah. Nothing. It, You know, and it's getting to the point where I think real life stories to bring awareness to domestic violence, human trafficking, and systemic corruption. Welcome to our podcasts and lives. We are so happy that you joined us and hope that you like and follow us and would love for you to share your thoughts in the comments below. Let the show begin. few of your videos and the such but you know I went to send you an invite and I'm like I just realized I don't even know her blessed name well it's Angela Jordan <laughs> it is a pleasure to meet you nice to meet you too I'm excited because I see what you do and it's you know one of my passions is to get those of us who care connected you know like we're yeah. not organized we're not connected and everybody who does the bad stuff is absolutely and it's pointless if you're Got all these individual groups, you know, trying to do this and trying to do that. And you just don't get very far. So that was one of my hopes with this is to bring survivors and organizations and communities and everything together in one place so that way we could be stronger together and start tackling things together. You would think that things like the Domestic Violence Network and all these organizations, you would think they would be doing that with all of the money that they make all of the time. However, (laughs) that is one thing I've learned is a lot of people wanted me to get on their boards and they wanted me to get grants. And I've learned that once you join a board, once you get a grant, they kind of own you and then they lose sight of purpose and then start running a business. So like, I don't charge anybody anything for what I do, which can be challenging. But I find that the people who aren't mentioning money when it comes to advocacy are the ones who are truly passionate and know what they're doing. Yes, it's 100% true. Unfortunately, a lot of these organizations are actually contributing to the problems instead of helping the problems. It's all a big money scheme. And what can you do? You know, you can't force somebody to actually do their job and do what they promise they're going to do. But hopefully we can make some headway and create some real change and go from there yeah i mean i feel like a lot of the people who are involved in this very showboaty and because of that that confidence in that ability to present something i don't have i'm not a good center of attention person they get this tremendous following but when you listen close enough you think their logic isn't there and yeah all the things we agree So <laughs> For sure, yeah, the, the more research that I've done, it's like all the realizations that you come to and it is absolutely sickening. And then to yeah. try to reiterate that and try to tell people, look, you know, I've looked into this thoroughly. This is what's happening. And to have people doubt that and be like, no, there's no way that's not true. Okay, so let me ask you, this is the question that's come to a forefront right now. As I am being scrutinized and chastised publicly right now, they're really trying to discredit me because I never talk about it and I have the receipts. So I, I did all this work with the federal commissioners and got Bell County exposed for trafficking children. Like there's, there's no question. It's a 45 page report of trafficking kids. I I felt like really guilty for celebrating that I could prove it was happening. Like that felt terrible to me, but I was actually celebrating that I saw I could get the community's eyes wide open. And that is not what happened. Nothing changed. Yeah. You know, and it's getting to the point where I think maybe I just need to start being an asshole and start, you know, look, people, this is happening. It is, it is fucking Children. Children are... That's where where I went with it and I just got out of jail because of it. You know, and it's like, God, it's time to wake up and to do something. If we can't come together to help the children, then what the hell can we come together for? You know, and that's just sad as a society that we're not coming together and doing more about this. 
Well, it's interesting because uh, I'm good friends with a couple of judges, right? They're they're minorities and I come from a mixed background and we come from different areas of the country. So we have these conversations because we know systemically what's happening. It's it's really interesting when you learn to step out of it and look like a foreigner at the system, you know, like and re- look at it objectively here. And one thing that they stated to me was we are actually raising a generation of slavery. And I said, OK, I, I don't completely disagree or agree. Like, work with me. Explain what your thoughts are. They said, you know, we have these children without placement that are put in these unregulated, unsupervised homes. Right. So we take them from their parents because they're doing such a bad job. We tell them that they're terrible children and nobody wants them. We don't make them go to school. They can do drugs. They can get pregnant. You know, and the caseworkers just sit there and record it. Nobody helps them. They get too rowdy. They hire police. You know, halo horn effect. I keep treating you bad. You're going to become bad. As they become bad, the counties get a bigger and bigger check for how, you know, a rowdy they are. If they run away, they don't look for them and they still get to collect the check. If they come back pregnant, we still get the check and now we get to take your baby and put your baby like basically on the market and nobody is going to advocate for you. But the bigger thing is, is here in Texas, are you in Texas? You're not, are you? No, I'm in Ohio. Okay. So in Texas, when they I don't brag uh, about that either. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry to learn this is not a state issue, a nation issue. So when they age out at 18, they get a free college plan. But the fact of the matter is only 3% of foster children use that college plan. And, and that is because we, most of them haven't graduated. 70% of the boys have touched the criminal justice system by the time they turned 18. Over, I think it's 33% of the girls have two babies by the time they're 21. They have no place to live. And so what do they do is they grew up in a safe home, not a loving home. So they don't know love. So they go out and do the things that people who are looking for love do. They work for $7.85 an hour. That's our minimum wage. It's ridiculous. And so then they're desperate for resources and make choices accordingly. And then what do we do? We go in and remove their children. And if we don't, we put them in the criminal justice system. We put them in the CPS system which means we continue to make money out from them. We're like pushing them through all these things, making money like they're slaves to the system to keep the rich, rich and the poor, poor. Absolutely. And it's a never ending cycle and it just continues to go around and around and around and nobody steps in to do it. Not only does the government not step in to do anything, they incentivize Yes, been going. I mean, they encourage these places to continue to do what they're doing by offering them thousands of dollars. Absolutely. I don't know if you know my story about how I got into all of this, but now I understand why people don't speak up too, because it's it's so deeply systemic and the public believes what they hear and it's all smoke and mirrors. It is so deeply systemic. I don't think there's many people who entirely know the entire process, but once you've been in different parts of it, you realize they have the power to make or break anybody who speaks up. Well, they sure do. They sure do. And Retaliation is very real, my friends. It's very real. Yeah. I don't know. Did you know that I went to jail this weekend because of that? Yeah, that's that's what led me to you. Okay. I saw that come across my news feed and I was like, oh my gosh. And I w- went and, and or I think it's the three or four parts or something or other. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and what's crazy is there's a whole smear campaign with my mugshot. At first I was, I'm, I'm not bothered. Okay, I went to jail for your kids. Like, you can count on me. Right. You know, and it didn't bother me. And a lot of people said really supportive things. I woke up afterwards after that horrible experience. I found that I had all these new followers and people were saying great things. But some of the people that I made lose their child placement contract, like a foster agency, a huge one. We were suspicious of him trafficking kids. And we knew, like, this is odd. He owns a funeral home, a Botox bar, all the things, right? And he is running for justice of the peace and trying to privatize CPS. And I'm like, all this seems incestual to the system. So we investigated him and exposed him. And he's been making my life challenging, to say the least. And so he took my mugshot and put it on social media and said, I am teaching children to make false outcries and I teach them perverted things. And I'm like, oh, my God. (laughs) Wow, that is ballsy. Oh, it's it's much worse than that, too. And I, I, I mean, part of me is bothered, right? But if you look at it, the, the comments are that are ridiculous. But, you know, I truly believe if I keep doing the right thing and keep telling the truth and I'm fearless. See, I don't have anything to hide that, you know, this will this will all work out. It'll all work out. 
Amen. I hear you. Yeah, I haven't I haven't had to deal with the retaliation like I mean outside of court yet, but I'm anticipating it coming. And uh, you know, what, what, happened, what happened to you in the court system? I'm curious. I I was beaten and raped for six miserable years before I was able to get safe. He held me against my will in New Hampshire. I finally was able to get safe and came here to Ohio where my family is. And a few years later, I had one of his more recent victims. Her family had reached out to me because they were terrified he was going to kill her. They were begging me for help. We wanted to see if there was anything I could do to try to help get her safe. The police department wouldn't believe her down there. She was repeatedly called a liar and treated like she was the perpetrator. And so I sent, you know, I, I have dozens of hours of the most disgusting abuse you could possibly imagine listening to. I mean, he's screaming me, telling me he's going to ruin my 13-year-old daughter, beating me, assaulting me with deadly weapons, telling me exactly how he's going to kill me and dispose of my body when get away with it because his mom works for law enforcement and blah, blah, blah. Can't get New Hampshire to press charges to save my life. All those recordings and they had the audio audacity to tell me, oh, well, all we see are misdemeanors here. There's no felonies that we can charge him with. And I'm like, do you want me to name like five off the top of my head for you? Right. Like, do you need help doing your job? <laughs> so yeah. I, I, have a, I have a theory about why this is, because people are like, who do they know? And I'm like, no, that's that's a statement that they've taught you to believe that people need to be connected for this to happen. I think that the reason that they do not do anything is because if they place children with the bad parent, the good parent is going to keep fighting. And so therefore they can continue to make money off them. That's the exact same conclusion that I've come to. Yeah. False restraining orders, you know, based on crazy accusations, guardian items that aren't qualified so you can't hold them accountable. I mean, blatantly breaking the law and then you get a restraining order because you called your child a pumpkin. (laughs) It's all backwards. It's all backwards. I mean, I was pretty lucky in the sense that like he did make several false allegations against me via the police department, the sheriff's department, child protective services. I mean, I was constantly having somebody show up at my door with somebody with such a desperate need for a while, well child check to be done. But I was fortunate and blessed in the sense that I never had any troubles with that portion of everything, which is, you know, now that I'm looking into everything, I'm shocked that I didn't. But I was really lucky that I had a really, you know, well, I guess not a multiple caseworkers have showed up at my door. And I've been fortunate to where they could see the situation for what it was and didn't cause any complications. But the judge, the magistrate, the court investigator, the guardian at litem, mind you, every single one of those that I just listed are females. <laughs> so the guardian at litem was by this point, we had been screwed over by the system so many times to the point that my daughter even recognized how terrifying all of this is. And it's- after her first appointment with her guardian at litem, right off the bat, her GAL was pressuring her, manipulating her, trying to coerce her. So by the time it got to the point where she had to go to her office for further appointments, my daughter was like, mom, am I allowed to take my phone? in and record her. I'm like, absolutely. Ohio, one person stay. You, If you don't yeah. feel comfortable, then you do what you got to do, girl. Check this too. But here's the thing that I've learned with that. If you record it, then they say that you set them up. If you get a child to do a really good interview, like a deposition or interview, then they believe they're trained or coached. So it's kind of like you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. Right. Well, I mean, they can say that all they want. But regardless, I mean, I don't care what the situation is. Listening to those, and I have five or six of them, different recordings of her meeting with her guardian at Lightum and Every single time she went to her office, that guardian at Lightum was threatening her, manipulating her, coercing her, bribing her into wanting to have a relationship with the man who abused her and then was getting angry with her when she wouldn't comply. Oh, and then to top it all off, she had the audacity to look at my 10 year old little girl who, mind you, over the last year has been struggling with hallucinations because all of this has been so horrifying for her. And she looked at her and she called her a liar. She told her that she's lying about being sexually abused. 
She's lying about her dad slapping her on a visitation when she had called him by his name instead of saying dad. And he slapped her across the face and said, you don't ever call me that. You are only to call me dad. And she was calling her a liar. And then on top of that, a, a guardian ad litem is required by law to file paperwork. I knew you were going to say that. Yeah, with yes. a conflict of interest. Months went by. Never once did she file anything with the court. It's like, I mean, she broke the law and her code of ethics repeatedly from the word go. And I'm curious. I am filing a complaint against her. I'm curious what will come of it. They better hold her accountable because I won't shut up and I won't quit starting shit until they do. So they well, fucked with the wrong one. <laughs> that's, that's kind of what I do for people is I file all the appropriate complaints so then I can also track and build the pattern. I don't know if I find like comfort that other people know this or completely disturbed that this is happening exactly the same way in another state. One of the trends that we have happening here in Bell County, Texas, is that we're not using board certified guardian items. They're just anybody wow. friend with a judge. So there is no way to hold them accountable because you can't go to our JBCC licensing board. You can't go to the Bar Association. There's nothing you can do because also our state law says that you cannot sue them and hold them accountable for the outcome. Well, yeah, but federal law is a Above state law and federal law put out tons of requirements for guardian ad litems. So maybe attacking it from that angle somehow. Interesting because I had actually never thought of that. I had been dealing a lot with CPS court. Now I'm sort of touching on the family court because it's the same characters, similar mm -hmm. scenario. And in CPS court nationwide, it's funded by Title IV e funding. And so when people try to Fuffo. I'm like, okay, your state policy, it doesn't matter how you're interpreting it, your county policy, because the people who are giving you money, you have to follow their policy. Yep. Period. So yep. if you don't understand well, the spirit, But to their dismay, there are rules and regulations and processes you have to follow. <laughs> Absolutely. I went to Colorado to testify in a hearing and I'm, I'm from New York, but I live in Texas. They're like, what do you know about Colorado? What do you know about Colorado? And finally, I'm like, hey, and elaborate for a moment. And she's like, I guess, you know, you all rude to me. And I was like, it doesn't matter if I know Colorado law, because at the foundation of everything that you've done, you have violated federal Title IV E funding under the human health services like regulations where you're supposed to work from a strengths-based model. You're, you're supposed to provide resources and support and help them attain that and leave them in a better position. And I went into all the different, and she took my notes from me because she's like, you can't have these up there. And I was like, that's fine. And she thought she was going to be really smart because she took my notes that I can't talk. I said, do you want me to continue? And she's like, well, let me give you a copy to everybody. And then when she looked at my handwriting, she realized she couldn't read it, which is really, <laughs> it's really funny because I was like, she thought she was going to one-up me. And then she's like, yeah, go ahead. Because she thought without my notes. And I'm like, I have a photographic memory. It's fine. And <laughs> yeah, and they made it seem like I was very irritating to them. But at the next hearings that I went to in Colorado, they said, well, if you do A, B, C and D, you can have your kids back. And I'm like, oh, after two years, I said, yeah, they don't want to tell you that they know they've been violating federal law for two years. Absolutely. That's, yeah. It doesn't matter what Colorado says. They're trying to give me in some other argument. This, this is where it's at. How disheartening. So what is the answer, do you think? You know, I don't know if you want to know my answer. I want to have the whole damn family court system apply. Polished. And uh, I don't know if you've heard of, about Francesca Amato. She's a <laughs> badass advocate and she wants them all to be tried for treason, which every single one of them should be. However, do I think that our government will step up and do the right thing and hold people accountable like that? Not a cold day in hell. You know, it's never going to happen. But we need to do something to force more regulation and more oversight with these courts. And it they, they need to revamp it. They need to revamp the whole process. It's not legal. I mean, the entire foundation for family courts violates our constitutional rights to begin with. So, yeah. you know, I mean, you're accused of all these things that you don't, you know, you're you're appearing in front of one person who's making all the dictations and all of the rulings many times unfairly, and there's nothing you can do about it. There's no opportunity to be guaranteed any kind of a fair hearing or trial through family courts. I've heard from judges. I know this case better than you. You shouldn't be invested. 
you should not be invested in this court case. You should not know it better than the therapist. You should not. In Travis County, they have an interesting system that my friend was telling me about where it's they call the open docket. So you don't see the same judge. It, it keeps going in circles. So that way, if the next judge is kind of following up on your case, like if there's been an error, they will catch it. I think that's probably as close to the most effective system that I've seen yet. And where is that at? I haven't heard of that. Travis County is also in Texas. And, you know, they're a little bit more liberal for being Texas, of course. But they're kind of like the cutting edge of like things going well. They are really bold and they speak up when they think a judge is corrupt is what I've seen so far. They are willing to make bold changes, but within the law. And the judge that I was communicating with about the trafficking and stuff, only reason that it actually got opened up is she was tracking her kids on her caseload, which is beautiful. That's amazing to see yeah. if your rulings are going well. And when she went to follow up, she found out her child was not where the child was supposed to be, as indicated. And so someone said, well, Angela lives in that county, you know, talk to her and find out the things. And so she did. We had a very long, detailed conversation. And I'm not sure she entirely believed some of the things I said at first, but they have proven 100% true. And then she sent commissioners in and it was even worse than what I had thought that it was. And she has made very bold moves to make sure that's known at a federal hearing. But here is the problem in Texas. And I don't know that many people know this. Back in 2011, I believe it was, our foster children hired Paul Yetter, an attorney, to sue the state of Texas. So we did. And it went to federal court under federal judge Dennis Jack. Well, we have been under the supervision of the federal court since then. You're talking over 10 years. And she has declared since that time that our foster care system is unconstitutional. Absolutely. So if she declared it unconstitutional, why is everybody mad at me for speaking up about it? She already ruled it. She is taking them back to court several times for contempt for not following her rulings or perverting them to their financial benefit. And still, people here in Texas don't know that that has been federally ruled. So I have never heard of it. I mean, I know I'm up here in Ohio, but still, you would think that something like that would make national news. No, no, it's not. And locally, people don't even know either, which is how they managed to put these children into homes with no supervision, no school, nothing. It's, it's it's so sad. And so whistleblowers were trying to speak up. But everybody I know who spoke up, including me, I was on their contract. We've all had profound retaliation. Our contracts cut off without justification. They've come after our families, like doing CPS cases on them. I have been under investigation for making false reports. I've been under investigation for failure to report. Which is it? My Lord. So they're just throwing <laughs> shit at the wall to see what they can get to stick. Oh my God, I said that exactly. <laughs> a little while ago. Yes. Really have mercy. It's so And then they're seeing what everybody wants to like acknowledge is stuck to the wall. Like everybody, like, oh yeah, yeah, that one. That's the that's the BS that we're gonna we're gonna buy today. For instance, okay, oh, it makes me mad that I see this. So the neighbors around these homes with children that are unsupervised complained and went to the police and city council. And we're near a military town. So it's one of the biggest military bases in the United States. We have never been able to legalize short-term housing for our soldiers. So when they get here, it's either hotel or an apartment. They're, we don't do short term. We don't do Airbnbs. And this is a major city. When they reported the CWAPs, they actually violated the city ordinance based on the fact that they're short term housing. And so separately, on like a day or two after this, the city all of a sudden approved short term housing. Oh, how convenient. Not for a military, not for a base that's been here for like 100 years, but because all of a sudden we don't want to lose our, you know, our money train. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Got to keep those kids being trafficked, keep that money coming in. Ab absolutely. The houses had over, one of them had over 900 calls to 911 in a year. Oh, shit. Yeah. They set fire in the driveway. They have the houses next to sex offenders. One of the homes, I did some research and I found out there was a transportation company and an entertainment company registered at the address. That's horrifying. It's it's terrible. And it's right there in the community. And they get away with it. Nobody says or does anything about it. Well, when they do, they make that disappear and they smear them to look, you know, 
horrible. Many of my caseworker friends that tried to speak up, they, they kind of got set up in a bad position and, and let go after they've been caseworkers for years. People say that caseworkers leave because of the caseload. It is not true. I think most of the caseworkers I know would work for free or, or the bare minimum in the very least if they could make a change. And they're shoving those people out who care, who are willing to speak up. And they're bringing in, they drop the qualifications for caseworkers here so you can be like 19 and have a little bit of college and make all of our major life choices. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Their three frontal lobe isn't even developed. Like, that should be a standard. (laughs) And like, and I would imagine, too, I mean, some of these houses that you show up with, that can be safe for a 19-year-old kid to be showing up at some of these houses either. I no, it, you know, if a 19 year old came in to judge me at almost 50 years old, right? I would absolutely toy with her. I can't take that seriously. But yeah, they've hired these young kids because I have a video that got taken down. One of the caseworkers was 19 was like, it's my first big girl job. No, no. Oh, oh my Lord. Oh, my. Yeah. They took it down or they took it down for it. They said I was picking on her, but she posted it. I just reposted it. And the thing is, they're so brainwashed because they are 19. And well, maybe she needs to be a big girl. When you're 19, someone's giving you your a medical problem. Big girl, like salary and a big girl respect. You're like, yay, yay. Oh, and then no. you're not question when they're like, no, no, you have to remove that child. And it's like, do we? Yes. So funny. So... How I ended up in this is I was a therapist for the department. Well, not for the department. I had a contract. I had many contracts with many people. The the department was one of them. It was my favorite. I loved working with foster kids. And my staff and I were wholly committed to following them county to county, home to home, home visits if they needed us, on call. We give them our cell phones. So we counsel the foster parents and the kid to help kind of merge them. We were intensive. Most therapists are not, right? When I initially started this, I had left working Travis County and started a private practice with a woman who already did this. But I saw her lining up clients in the lobby and just pulling them back for a second to check in with them and send them on their way. And she was just billing like she did a session and making court reports like she did a session. And I was like, oh, no, that's no. not cool. And, and, and even to this day, I look at one of my years of work compared to hers and I was making about 42 and she was making 200 and something like and, and I calculated it per the rate that we would get. And that meant she had to see 58 clients a week just on that contract. And so I separated myself and she was very malicious with me, like did lots of things. So anyhow, I started my own contract and it took a while for me to build the credibility, but I made sure I met with every caseworker every month, uh, worked with the parents, worked with the kids. I love testifying court. I'm the only one who loves court. And I had quite a name going for myself. Very well respected. It made me want to apply for law school, which I have. I applied to the forensic board to do that. And I didn't understand why I was kind of getting this court celebrity status. Like people would be like, oh, I've been looking forward to meeting you. And I was like, awkward. Like, okay. And I think that they were trying to recruit me. I, I look in hindsight and I think that's what was happening. So something happened with my grandchild. And I didn't know. I kept hearing it secondhand, but I, I, did, I didn't know. But I'm a mandated reporter. So I called up the department. And I'm like, hey, I'm calling it in because I'm a mandated reporter. I, I don't know. It, it's not something I've seen or heard, but it, it keeps being told to me. So I report and it's the other grandparents that had seen it. And th- that's kind of crucial because I believe that my current charges are because I reported. I think that's what the harassment is, is because I reported, which they confirmed the accusations and did a case with my daughter-in-law and the kids and the kids went to the grandparents, right? This all seems beautiful, but why did they get in trouble for failure to report when they're the ones who actually knew? So a month or two goes by and things are really weird with the kids. The other grandparents say they have hand, foot, mouth disease, COVID, strep throat, sleep apnea, seizures. I was like, y'all need to do an exorcism on that house. Right, (laughs) something, that's a lot of something, something's to have. In two months. Two months. So, contaminate or something. 
<laughs> then she tells me she wants to put my five-year-old grandson in a psychiatric hospital. I'm like, you know, like um, a, a psychotherapist that specializes with kids. Like, he's not even a therapy. Why don't you give him to me? I have no problems with him. He's great. So she refuses, and then cancels his counseling so that I can't go talk to the counselor. I'm like, okay. So I say to mom, I'm like, something's going on. I have like icks in my tummy about this. She said, well, nobody was believing me. I didn't think you would. I told the caseworker, nobody listened. So she gave me that video that's on my TikTok page. The little boy who's screaming for dear life and hiding and they're shoving him in the bathtub with his clothes on. Did you see that? I don't think I did. Oh, it's terrible. And a grandmother is screaming at him. You've been this way since you came out of her. And there, he has social anxiety. I do too. And he didn't want to take his clothes off when they were upset. I, I wouldn't either. And so they were trying to shove him in a bathtub over and over. He punched him in the side of the head. A grown man, a gra- the grandfather, retired military, very strong guy. And my little tiny grandson, the screams like still like, I, f- I feel like I'll throw up duck. So I gave that to the guardian at light um, like insert all the things that you said a moment ago, right? Well, we get to court later because I got the kids and then they, they had to be investigated and they ruled out abuse. They said it was a bad day. So it's okay to be abusive as long as it's just a bad day. Once in a while, it's okay. You're just having a bad day. It's all right. Don't worry about it. What the fuck yes. it is that hat? Well, it gets worse. So the, the grandparents apply to intervene for custody, saying dad is a horrible person and mom is too. The police say dad's a horrible person. The psychologist and the therapist say dad needs anger management. And so we go to court and, and they don't know where dad lives. Never seen it. Mom's had a steady place this whole time. And the kids are steady with me. Without even seeing if dad has a home, they separate the kids and give him the baby. Because a baby should go to a dangerous situation like that. And a home they don't know exists with people who have bad days. So I still have my grandson and he's stuttering. He's breaking down. This is really hard on him. And he had been in therapy and the therapist said she could see a clear difference from when my grandson was with them to me. And now that they've been separated and the school said he had started stuttering so badly they couldn't understand him. They'd even make a visitation plan for the kids to get together, which is against all their codes and regulations, rules, all the things. OK, so I, I'm angry. And I told my daughter, let me see your paperwork. I, I, I haven't ever looked at it. I tried to stay out of it. Well, it says in her paperwork that they took the kids because she drove her car into a building to kill herself. It never happens. That never happens. Yes. Oh my gosh. I can't even come up with this stuff. Like that can be easily proven false. If I have to make a report, then my report has to say as evidenced by and, you know, the evidence. No, this is the most ludicrous things. And I and there's so much to it. And they eliminated his criminal history, you know, the father of the other child, because they have two different dads. That dad, they eliminated all of his criminal history, like it didn't exist, you know, ignored all everything that everybody had told them about him. It, it was so out of control. And so I, I was upset. And I ran a background check on all the people involved. And it was like, the attorney had, like, you know, charges. The caseworker had charges. I looked at the caseworker's husband on social media, and he's picking on gay people, addressing in drag and saying derogatory things to women. I I mean, it was just... It was horrendous. I found out our CPS court judges used to be married to each other and have businesses together. Oh, my Lord. And they were making all sorts of crazy statements towards me, like they should go in foster care instead of live with me. And I'm like, I I work for you. I'm the celebrity. Remember the one you were so nice to before? I'm the cool kid. What are you talking about? I like I testify for you all the time, but I shouldn't have this kid. Plus, I did foster care for years, but I shouldn't have my own grandchild that I see on a regular basis and who is fine for me. It just got all weird. And so I called the attorney and she came over to my house, which was amazing. We spent like five, six hours together and she showed me all the laws of how everything was wrong. I was like, what do you want to do? And I'm like, I don't know. Well, meanwhile, my staff and friends got mad and they posted it all over social media. Nice. I can't say I hate it. I call can't. out the BS. Just call it all out. <laughs> yeah, just cut that wound open. <laughs> and go um, bigger, go home. I mean, shoot. So I mean, call- what, what else are they going to do at this point? Yeah. You don't have to lose anymore. So then it got 20.3 million views. Nice. <laughs> and so then they called an emergency court hearing. Because now it's an emergency, by the way. That's so funny. I bet it is. I need to shut you up in a quick, fast hurry. 
they blamed me for everything everything it said that i did it and i did this and i did that and i'm like okay well you know in forensics we kind of watch how things happen because what you're saying is what you're really thinking so then they had to change caseworkers because they said the caseworker was scared of me now like i'm your and be very afraid. I can't wait to, <laughs> to pick up the baby to give him to dad. I was like, mom needs to know the new daycare and the location. She's like, no, she doesn't. And I'm like, this is not a conservatorship state. You don't have conservatorship. This is a family-based services, which means she still has her rights. And so this has nothing to do with CPS. This has everything to do with the family law code. And the the caseworker kept saying, like, no, I'm trying to tell you, I'm trying to tell you. And I'm like, look, you're a shitty enough caseworker for what you did. Don't try to be a jailhouse lawyer. I know you have three DWIs. I don't know, maybe you're drunk in court today. I don't know. But you probably should just, like, realize, like, I'm pissed and it's on. Yep. Oh, game on. Well, I mean, and, and they push you to that point, you know? I mean, when they don't stop and it's just ignorance on <laughs> ignorance that it's, I mean, it's, it's literally like a slap in your face with the way that they treat you. And they expect you to walk away with a smile and they thank them for <laughs> fucking up your whole life. So how bold do you have to be to say she drove her car into a building? And, you know, it probably would have ended like somewhere in there. But when they called the emergency hearing, they said they were giving my grandson back to his mom because I was unhinged. That was the exact term. And I'm like, that isn't why we returned kids. But OK, he made it home. But then they did a hearing and OK, the CPS case was closed. So why did the judge leave the courtroom open for the attorneys to work with the parents on a custody agreement? That's a CPS thing. That's and they a totally different hearing and somebody needs to initiate that with amen tokens. and so her attorney from the cps case stayed in the room and pretended to be her attorney but since the case was closed that would mean it's not her attorney and they bullied her into letting him have the baby and she got my grandson Another thing I learned in this entire process is I did not know that my grandson's mother, I refer to her as daughter-in-law, I didn't know she couldn't read very well. So she actually didn't know that it said she drove her car into a building. She didn't know what a lot of these things were. And they knew she couldn't read because they did a psychological test on her and her reading level was like very low, but way below average. Oh, wow. So they're taking advantage of... Gosh. That's just, yeah, it's sickening. it's sickening hearing what they do. And and even when they get called, called out, even when it's discovered that there's illegal activity happening, still nothing is done about it. There's well, no accountability. What's done is to punish me. And I told them, you're, you're wrong on this, because if you continue to punish me and take things from me, then I have less things to worry about losing. So, OK. So this all ended in December and in January, one of my clients contacted me and said, hey, my caseworker told me and she's willing to be a whistleblower, but not until she gets out of state, that they had a whole meeting about how they're going to get rid of you. And she told me and it was 100 percent accurate down to the date and the event and the accusation over the next three months. They called up every foster parent that I worked with and told them that if they continue to bring their children to me, that they would remove them. They told every parent that I had been working with for like over a year that they needed to drop me as a therapist or their kids would stay where they were. And then they told everybody they had a court order. I wasn't allowed to be in the courtroom. No court order exists. I mean, they so said that a whole slew of people behind you that can verify that they're using illegal activity to blackmail and coerce. Yeah. <laughs> and the caseworkers don't know what they're doing, right? So they're putting this in writing and text messages and emails and voicemails over and over and over. So they couldn't get my contract tick from me because I didn't do anything wrong. So they did a smear campaign. Well, as time went by, people still kept coming to see me. As a matter of fact, they wanted to see me because they banned me. So they knew that there was something good there. Yeah. You know, yes. It was like free publicity for you. Pretty much. One of my clients said they gave me a list of people I could see. Your name was blacked out. So I want to talk to you. <laughs> I'm like, you're my people, friend. Nice. So we, we go from there and, and like the summer is it seems okay. The summer is going fine. But in September, a whistleblower comes to me 
and tells me I got fired and I want you to help me because I spoke up and sent, you know, the problems and the solutions to the administration up high. And I said, can I, can I tell people what you gave me? And she said yes. And so I connected her with the federal court stuff and the judges. The second I did it, I won't forget, it was my birthday. And then the other judge called me and said, hey, my kid is lost. Talk to me. It was the day after my birthday. I was like, this is the best present ever. She's like, we're going to bring the commissioners there to investigate. I was like, yay! I look about same time. Yes. And so by the middle of September, they had been here and all the caseworkers were buzzing and finally feeling brave enough to speak up. So like the third week of September, I get an email that says your contract is terminated. And I was like, okay, why? And they were like, we investigated you and you broke and it lists all these laws and stuff. And I was like, what did you investigate? Where? How? How do I appeal this? And she's like, we talked to our attorneys. You can't appeal it. And I was like, okay. That doesn't make it any sense at all. Yeah, it, it, it absolutely doesn't. But I mean, they couldn't get me any other way. So they right. continue now to just break the law and just hope that by the time the law catches up with them, that like, I'm not around to say anything. So then I finally get a phone call around this time because, you know, I made people mad. And it was an officer telling me I needed to take down the videos of my grandson. And I was like, and I had reported the abuse to the police because if CPS didn't do something, maybe the police would. Right. And I was like, I don't think you're doing very good investigative work because <laughs> I didn't post it. So I can't take it down. And she was hollering at me and threatening me. And I was like, okay, I'm going to use talk to my attorney. I'm going to tell you. So time goes by even more. And then I investigate a trafficker and he gets exposed and like loses his, his contract with the state and stuff. So then he joins forces with these guys. And he oh, hears nothing like CPS continuing to work with a known trafficker. Yeah, and money laundering and just, you know, just a few things. I mean, this guy is so bold at what he does. He went on a national TV show and gave celebrities a baby and deemed himself the guru of adoption. How did he get that baby? How did he get a little red-headed, blue-eyed boy specifically like this celebrity asked? And why would he deem himself the guru of adoption? When he owns a foster agency, unless you intend on making sure these children do not make it, nobody questioned it for the entire nation. And I'm oh, just yeah, going it right in our face. And they don't, they don't care. They care zero. And apparently uh, society cares even less because we let them get away with it. And we don't do a damn thing about it. Right, right. So he went to the police station and the police station told me that to their understanding, I was harassing him because I was a prostitute. And uh, CBS came in and oh, caught, me, caught me in the act with the kids and took the kids. And I'm like, OK, so he clearly doesn't know me because they're not my children. They're my grandchildren. But hey, thinking I'm looking that young. Great. <laughs> Thank you. And they said that he testified at the hearing against me. And I was like, there was no hearing to testify. It was a CPS case with my daughter-in-law. It wasn't even conservatorship. So he wouldn't have been in foster care. There would have been a placement agency. And I don't, I've never heard of a placement agency testifying in investigations. Anyhow, like none of this makes sense. So they told me that they were just going to arrest me. And I was like, you know, this is in the news. Like, right? Are, are you going to arrest the reporters? I'm very confused. And so then she said that I was threatening him because I said I was busting his balls, which at that time I had to Google because I'm like, maybe in my New York nature, I don't realize like that. Maybe that is more offensive than I realized <laughs> it said exactly what it means. And I'm like, that's not a threat. She said I was threatening him. He's scared of me. And then he went to the school board and the school board fed into it. And my colleague that works at the school in here, they basically suspended him from work for five months. I'm like a black male teacher and we have a teacher shorted and you're going to take him out because this guy complains. But I mean, they were hitting us at every direction from my contract to this, to the school. And it just got crazier and crazier. They contacted his ex-wife and she got involved in it. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. This is worse than Tela Nueva. And so it kind of all came to a head. And then they said, well... OK, so I guess what we're going to do is arrest you out of this department. And the only thing out of that department was me reporting the grandparent for abuse. So I'm like, OK, so my attorney is working at Angle for a while, lost my contract, you know, all the things. I'm fine financially. I'm a good therapist. But um, all of a sudden, CPS starts coming relentlessly for failure to report. 
and they can't make up their damn mind as to what they want to try to get you for. And it's like, okay. And I'm like, I was just really lost on this whole thing. So am I in trouble for reporting or failure to report? Because you said that wasn't abuse. So you want me to report? Okay. And one of them was as someone else's case. And I said, not only did I report to CPS, but I reported it to the local police department and the town over because the police departments can't decide who is responsible. I also spoke to the judge and the guardian at Lightum and gave mom the report to distribute as needed. He's like, well, nobody has those reports anywhere. So I'm like, okay, so uh, <laughs> Huh? I was more incompetent then. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, like, folks, this is not a me issue. So then the officer, I'm like, okay, I look at his name and I'm like, hey, I know your wife, you know, and I kind of say something and he softens immediately. I'm like, yeah, I used to be a therapist at the prison. I said, your, your wife, I know her from there. And I said, do you remember like when you guys went through this time and somebody donated all this stuff to you? And he was like, oh, yeah, yeah, that was me. I said, so, I mean, if I'm going to help you out and I don't even know you, why would I not be helping these kids and fail to report? So he was great. He wanted to back me up. And then the mom called to follow up on the case and the officer had changed. I'm like, of course it did. Because he's like, call any time. So we need a different officer. Well, the officer said, we cannot take, you know, Miss Jordan's information, her CAC interview, her anything, which I do weeks to do my CAC interview over weeks, not like the centers do in one hour. And she said, well, and she also needs to have this exam done and that exam done. And she's like, we already did all that. And Miss Jordan submitted her report. She, oh, we're not going to take her report. Hold up. You came to my house at seven o'clock in the morning and accused me of failure to report. You ask for my notes and I give them to you. But now you say you're not going to use them and told her I was under investigation. And I was like, so we're just going to spread those reports everywhere but so then mom is trying to call back to get more information on the case and the new officer doesn't respond at all like at all so then we find out that there is like an agenda that they're saying that the accusations are false i'm like wait a second i failed to report or I reported false allegations. The officer is going to help. And he's going to find out. different story now. Yes. And so it's just like, it's been a whirlwind. And I'm like, I don't need to do much because y'all are so messy that you are being this bold and this ridiculous. And I told my daughter-in-law, I said, now that they really, they put a warrant out for my arrest on a misdemeanor. Have you ever heard of such a thing? That's <laughs> Yes, it's a class B misdemeanor. And so I'm like, I got to turn myself in. I'm like, girl, like, they're probably going to come after you to take the baby. I mean, he's seven, but they're going to take him. I said, because if I'm gone and they keep picking on you, they're probably going to come get him. And I text this to her on Monday and she's like, not believing me. Thursday, CPS showed up and I was like, I'm, I'm not psychic. Like, this is the strategy. And then I started getting notices that they sent stuff into the board to, to try to question. I mean, they're really just trying to keep me busy, I think, is what they're trying to do, because all of this is really outrageous. Yes. So between that and the Facebook stuff and the retaliation and I mean, it's just crazy. I, and, it, you know, at first I was upset, but I, I bet you know this feeling. I, you know, feeling. I was upset at first and I was like, no, I'm not upset because I must be hitting a nerve and doing something right. Yeah. And, you know, it's just more of us. We need more people to stand up and speak out. They can't retaliate against us all. If we all stand up and come forward, we desperately need people to be more brave. And I, this is going to continue unless we yes. do something about it. And it's our responsibility as society, as citizens of the United States, it is our responsibility to hold these people accountable and to not let them get away with it. When we don't speak up, right, then we are part of the problem. We are allowing them, we're enabling them to do this. Exactly. Well, the whole time being raised, what were we taught? Shut your mouth and mind your business. It ain't none of your business. Stay out of it. So I had a client who told me something one time and it just blew my mind, you know, because we're so used to accepting things. And I never thought of this. He said that there should be no active shooter situations in the United States if we would respond correctly. And I was like, I'm lost. And he said, there is only one shooter. There is a crowd of people because everybody runs in fear and they act on fear. It allows the shooter to do what the shooter is doing. And it is wrong. He is chasing you and you are running. You are playing his game and enabling it to happen. He said if an open shooter was there, an entire crowd of people, and the crowd turned fearlessly on the shooter, 
couple people might get hurt, but nobody's playing that game. And it sure will deter the next shooter because he's not going to get the response that he thinks he's going to get. He has no power. And I thought that is amazing. That is that is 100 percent true. Absolutely. Absolutely. We, ha- we have to start creating new norms. I mean, you know, we learn, we grow it throughout the years. We find things that work and things that don't. But we get yeah. so stuck in our way with habits and and such that we're completely missing out on so many opportunities to create real change and to, you know, create good and to overcome this evil by just keeping our heads in the sand. Danielle, when you think about this, we have everything that we need to make all these things better. We have all the answers. We we have all the solutions. We have all the opportunity. It's just that we're not working together. Yeah. Yeah. We have to come together. I mean, it's just, it's imperative. We have to. I mean, survivors can't do it alone. Communities can't do it alone. We have to work together and we all have to be in this all at the same time to push forward and force them to change. We have to let them know, look, this is unacceptable. We are not going to stand for it. We are not going to tolerate it anymore. So figure your shit out and get it together because this ain't going to hurt no more. Absolutely. And and we need to make it a more normal conversation. I think that's the biggest thing. People say, what can I do? And here are the things that I think people should do. You know, there's different degrees of commitment here. But first of all, stop talking about the neighbor who needs help and gossiping and go offer them a hug, some childcare, a casserole, a pep talk. Start treating people like they're human instead of objects of like your lack of healthy mental health because it's an, you shouldn't feel good and better about yourself for demeaning somebody else. Those calls that go into the department need to be serious. And, and that kind of does start with us. We need to start loving one another, right? The second thing that people can do is if you're going to sit there on the phone, do research, Google these things. Things. Get educated. Have conversations. People aren't talking about it. You know, we're allowing the media to direct us to, to crazy other topics, but not one of the biggest problems that's going on that is going to land on your doorstep eventually. You know? Yep. Oh, and the media is just as much a part of this corruption. And, and I think that over the last, you know, 10 years or so, we've really started opening our eyes to just how corrupt the media is and only reporting what they're allowed or told to report report. And, you know, again, same thing. Only we as as communities and we as society can force that to change. Boycott them. Don't watch them anymore. You know? I mean, well, that's send, that's them, why, send we, them letters saying, look, I'm not going to watch you. Not only am I not going to watch you, I'm going to talk to every single person I know and encourage them to not to watch you until you start covering the truth and start covering the real matters that need to have more attention brought to them. You know, that, hold them accountable. Yes. Same yeah. as we do with our politicians. And that is exactly why we started our TikTok spot. And I say we because it's been passed around from ownership from each person trying to stay out of trouble. But it's because it's really what's happening. It's And we cite our sources and we state it neutrally like this is a fact. And this might be what we think doesn't mean that we're right because we don't have a good news source. We don't. There is so much stuff going on in this community right now that is so blatantly obvious. You know, I could give you 20 examples of, of crazy crazy dangerous situations happening and we're not talking about them because news stations are concerned about the liability. Well, I'm concerned about the liability too, which is our children. So yeah. you just put well, a price tag on liability. Our Women and children are being killed at unprecedented rates. How about that? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that I'm in so much trouble, right? But about, I'm going to say 10 years ago, we had a sexual harassment, assault, rape prevention officer on base. He was an officer E7, I believe. And the SHARP victims, because that's the acronym, he was pimping out the assault victims. So he got convicted and all the things. They said he was going to serve 10 years. I don't think he served a day because he ended up out in the community here in Bell County, Texas. He became a foster parent. Wow. And in the community, when he got exposed, me, when he got exposed like that, then he opened up She Will Foundation, which is a foundation here in Colleen that is very indescript at what they do. But the school has them on their resource list. 
to help like women and children. And we did a mayor ribbon cutting ceremony. We gave them a QE grant. They're a 501c3. I'm like, absolutely what we should not do with pimps. Lord have mercy on my soul. And, and you know, and it's it's here. It's in the community and right in front of their faith. But because we're not talking, because we're not checking on our neighbors, we make our neighbors victims and we allow these situations to happen. And it's the perfect storm. We think it's not going to happen to us and it does and it will. Yep. And then you regret not standing up and speaking out and saying, oh, gee, maybe I guess I should have done something. And yeah. gosh, what is it? Between 3.3 and 5 million families every year are investigated by CPS. So if you think it can't happen to you, you just hold on. Give it a year or so. They'll be there. Absolutely. Wait just till you, t- you make somebody mad, you know? Yeah. And, 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 you know, one thing that I have learned about this, and I'm not sure what to do with it. I don't know how to organize, but it seems like us ladies get together at night and on the weekends. Uh, I'm usually up till two in the morning helping people and me doing the paperwork for so-and-so and her doing it for so-and-so. And we do it for each other. And it makes it easier than doing our own stuff. And just that little bit of support, these moms have told me gives them hope again. It's that simple. It's that simple. And it's, I mean, and that's all that a survivor want is just a shred of hope, a shred of light. I mean, you you go through, you know, whether it's, you know, through a relationship or the system abusing you or CPS abusing you, I mean, whatever the case may be, yeah. you feel so hopeless and they beat you down until you feel like you're absolutely nothing. And, you know, and, and there's not really much that you can do to pull yourself out of that either. Either. Yeah. No, because it's like, okay, so I say this all the time when people are like, why doesn't an abused child make it out cry? I'm like, because a lot of times this is all they know. They aren't 100% sure that they are abused. How do they know the difference between you make them clean their room and they don't like it and you're doing inappropriate things? They don't 100% know, which is why the community should be involved, right? Well, it's the same with kids who are in foster care. Like, this gets normalized to be treated like an animal. You know, they, they talk about safety, 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 not love. And then I was really sitting there thinking when I was in jail, I was, you know, there's something else to do. <laughs> and, you know, when I saw them knock this guy's teeth out and it was just like, they were, there was a lady who had a DBT, a blood clot in her leg, and they weren't getting us any help or anything. And we were just laying on the cement floor trying to use our Crocs to like use as a pillow for any sort of comfort. They kept telling me this is normal. This is normal. This is how it always is. Some of the people in there had to succumb to like this is natural and normal and I said you know this makes me think of when kids are abused and they figure it out and they have to normalize it to survive and they can't tell the difference they have to make like abuse normal and make it like it is broccoli because if they have to accept the reality of it their little psyches are going to break and so then when you go into foster care you kind of accept that too that this is your reality and that you're bad. Everyone treats you bad. And you have to accept that because what are you going to do? You don't have the ability to fight back from that. And it's easier to just go with it and accept this label. And here we are, a group of ladies. By the way, these people in jail were just for like library books, paid the ticket, but didn't go to court. Nothing bad, right? But they had been picked on so much for these small little things that they thought that this was okay and normal because they've accepted it. That makes me really sad that these kids who are abused don't get it straightened out as they get older and get help and know that they have value and know that they're loved and that they are not bad and instead they continue on till they're in jail and they're probably going to come back a few times they think it's okay to be arrested for a library book like really that breaks my heart because then we have judges who are doing all the things they know that are wrong and it's almost like you know when you're that broken if people see it and they're in a position of power they target you because they know you're going to accept it they can make it look like they're doing something in the criminal justice system if they keep arresting the people who accept the abuse. Yeah. And so I feel like there's two things going on. Like when you have your court case, right? Like the one that you had, one, they want to break you so they can continue to pick on you in other ways and make money that way. But, you know, if you had a child, they try to put it with him so they could also make money while you fight, while they break you down. And I just don't know how they can sleep at night. 
Yeah, I don't I don't get it either. I don't understand how anybody and it's not like it's just, you know, a few random people here and there. Like it is groups of them in every single county across the nation. Yes. And that is why when we see adults who are misbehaving or struggling, instead of talking about them, they are probably the kids who don't know the difference between broccoli and abuse. No, they're adults. And so instead of being so angry, treat them with kindness because if they don't ever learn value, they're always going to be the target, you know? Absolutely. And yeah, we need more healing. Let's let's people trying to start a bunch of drama and BS and Yeah, absolutely. You know, these court systems just it's it's very disturbing that that an entity would have so much power and so much ability to be able to do a tremendous amount of good. And they make the choice to go the opposite direction with that and destroy lives. And that is a choice that they make. It's a hundred percent a choice. It's a hundred percent I can I can we can prove it. I was saying, this isn't a statement. This is a fact. They, they are along starting all sorts of shit around here. Like, I'm not going to stop until the judge here is off the bench. That shady ass girl needs to go. Uh, uh, you know? And, and it's I'm like, I'm going to warn you, though. I'm going to warn you. It's like whack a mole because I felt the same way. And our judge is stepping down. I was like, whoop, whoop. But then all the people from his office are stepping in. So I just kind of pushed to get rid of one and I got three more that are yeah. replaced. I mean, it's, it's sometimes I feel like it's. It's emptying the ocean out with a spoon, but what kind of is? Yeah, and I don't know if it's worth all the fight, but it's got to be because I can't accept the the opposing side of that. So I mean, one at a time, but we got to start somewhere. You know, we got to do something, and you know, maybe it's something that you just keep going back at them, and eventually they're going to learn. Well, shit, I better hey, I better do uh, do my job the right way, or these people are going to keep coming out of me, and I'm not going to have a job, right? I when I got out of jail, my son had the best attitude. He's my last one at home, and I just thought I need to remember this because he has such a fresh, innocent perspective on this whole thing. And so I'm like, "Are you embarrassed?" And he's like, "No." He's like, "Heck, I'm excited." And I was like, "What?" And he said, "Somebody, Duncan. His mom was arrested for a traffic ticket, and so he put her mugshot on a T-shirt and put free mom is now like a trending thing." No. And and, I, and he said, look. And so he put up my mug shot. And so then we got talking about it. And I said, you know, what would be really great is if we get our own backdrop to do mug shots. And on the plate, we hold it up for all the moms that come through here. Like, I went to jail for my kid or I will go to jail for your kid and my kid. And we put this on like a bunch of t-shirt and promote this movement that like stand together like i will not only go to bat for my kid but your kid too like just so man he's just a teenager but i was like this is awesome i'm sad and he's yeah. excited <laughs> Well, you know, sometimes kids like that. Ooh, drama. Ooh, something exciting. He's a real quiet kid. So I thought it was funny. He's like, I don't know if people are going to know what that free mom thing means. And I was like, either way, it's still funny. Like, and it's kind of like a superhero, I'm sure, in his eyes. You know what I mean? I'm mean, looking at it from a kid's perspective. Well, so I talked to my reputation manager today, which apparently I have now. It costs more than an attorney. And he was talking about taking down my mug shots. And I'm like, I don't care if you take those down, just like the sleep easy comments and he's like what and i said yeah because when i came home and i took a nap i said i woke up to like all these followers and people were where they were jets and i would say how do we get the community together and i guess it's me being the sacrificial lamb and yeah. getting people talking because i'm the most quiet person like at home like you wouldn't expect this right and he he was like you have such a great attitude about this and i'm like heck yeah i will go to jail for my kid do not question this and do not take my credibility not just my kid my grandchild i, I will i will go to jail for your kid right is right and the law is the law and i am trying to protect a child no law for harassment is like better than protecting a child from abuse and he's like i have literally never had a client tell me it's no big deal to <laughs> well now you're the cool mom um, shoot. <laughs> yeah, I'm just mad because I actually went in there with my hair all done and my makeup and they did not book me right away. They booked me like 18 hours later and I was like all rough. And I was like, dang it. I had a plan. It was so pretty. <laughs> I was. And when I was falling asleep in there at the jail cell, I, I, these 
two little old black ladies got arrested together. They were like almost 70 and they were the cutest little thing. I heard them talking while I was trying to sleep and they're like, she don't look like she belong in here. She looked like she's somebody's wife, somebody who makes money. And they're like, like they funny. Jeez, um, how many times were they in there? Shoot. <laughs> well, what's funny is they had never, I don't think, I think they said they hadn't been to jail since in their 20s, but they were best friends. They were so cute because she's like, oh, my hair would be messed up for the mugshot. And so they were like braiding each other's hair, getting ready. <laughs> nice. Nice. I mean, that's isn't the that, like, isn't that how, you can be in the some braids for me before I get my mug shot. But isn't that amazing? Like you can, it, it's the circumstances don't matter is the attitude. Absolutely. It, and that message just kept coming, coming through over and over the past few days. So yeah. Yeah. And honestly, I'm going to be a little sad if it gets me in trouble and I don't get to have my private practice or something. I'll be sad. But also, let me tell you, that is one less thing I have to worry about losing. They, they're so hard to spinning this around. If I don't have to lose there's nothing holding me back like you know, god closes one door another will open so yeah they're absolutely. probably just gonna open another door that's even more badass for you so whatever thank them exactly and by the way orange is my color <laughs> it brings out my eyes yes absolutely <laughs> and, you know if you want to do more podcasts together or you want to do more of this i I would love to. I am really passionate about this. Wow, for sure. I need a couple other girls that every so often we hop on to do like a, a real talk type sort of, of episode. We've oh always done one. I've been saying I want to do that. I would please. Yes. Yes, yeah, so let's do it. You can join our group. That's yes. I finally have a group. How did you end up finding me? Did somebody refer you to me? Possibly. I was on TikTok. I, I don't know if I was okay. scrolling through or if somebody I know commented on your thing or tagged me in one of your things. I'm not sure. I'd have to go back through. I have brain damage. I have a, a large brain aneurysm. My ex used to strangle me and, and hit me in the head a lot. And uh you know, Several years after I left and got saved, found myself being life slighted so for emergency brain surgery. Had no clue I even had an aneurysm. But well, I have a photographic memory, so we'll make a good pair. Like we pair up, I'll remember everything for you. But if you do have any ideas about how to connect with more and more people, I would love to. I got to get back to work pretty soon. But I would love to show you how I do my friends at Gathering of Information. Like, for instance, the person who's picking on me on Facebook, right? I look because I had a suspicion who it was. And I went into these little search things that I have to find their newest email. It tells me what dates their emails started. And I found the email and I clicked on it. And I wanted to know what social media it was registered with. And. And Bazinga, it told me that that was the person harassing me. And yeah. I can pull up the backgrounds and stuff on people. Like, I don't say I'm like stalking, but like, <laughs> I'm terrible. But like to find out who you're dealing with when you're aware. Like, yeah, there was a advocate named Belinda Putnam that was the state called her and she testified against my mom's. And when I checked her out, she had 31 criminal charges. I don't know why the state would have called her. But, well, because she would conform yeah. to whatever they wanted her to do. If she did, she did. So, yeah, I think it's helpful to teach each other how to check people out and make sure that they're valid and credible and all the things. Well, let's get our, our little our groupie together. And you know, we're planning on doing lots of different stuff. Like we want to get some petitions going this summer, start try to get different groups you know, across the country to do you know, rallies like on a mass scale. I know that's kind of hard to plan, but uh, we're going to do our hey, best. Let's see what don't we laugh do. at me, but I bought a book called How to Start a Cult. So I I could try to get people like, like, what? How do they have Christmas? How do they do that? And this book explains it. And I'm like, I don't know if I'm capable. Like, maybe, maybe take bits and pieces and put a positive spin on it. <laughs> it basically is an instruction manual to be like an underqualified, overconfident, middle aged white guy that's overpaid for a job he can't do. That's how it describes I mean, shoot, that could work well for us. It might. I also came up with a fun name. I don't know if I'll use it, but Just Us League. Like, Just Us. And, wrong. and I was like, I think I might go with that because, you know, it kind of tells people, but it doesn't tell them what we're up to. And it can kind of be a code name there. Yeah. But I am I am deeming misdemeanor mom t-shirts, like, with all. <laughs> this I, I need to start doing, too. I need to put together some cool designs for some merch. And so I have an online store, and I think I have, like, one basic shirt listed. 
Like, I haven't had time to really get to it at all. Because I mean, you know, doing the, the podcast, and then I have to edit all the videos and then promoting on social media and being a mom. And it's like, I wish I had like five of me because there's so much I can do. I just don't have the time. And I have narcolepsy. So like, if I'm stressed, I'm like, <laughs> the only thing is though is tiktok is not a fair platform like i don't think i'd get kicked off from facebook if i was on it but tiktok is always kicking me off <laughs> like, i haven't had a problem with that yet they they took down a couple of my videos well three thus far one of them though i appealed and they did go ahead and put it back up but then just a couple of days ago i had another one not only taken down they violated me for it and it's like and it was a video kim kelly who was born into a Christian cult that was sex traffic along with 20,000 other children. I mean, this is a true story, her story. Okay. And they're like, so, oh, this is false information. It's, it's because people are reporting your page, period. Yeah. Okay. Last Wait, we're going to be great. We're going to do great. We're great. Yeah. Let's we'll take some off together. I give people who help me, and I'm going to have to send you one, crocheted pineapple that says, I'm a pineapple. It's fine. Everything's fine. It's like, fine. I have really good connections, too, with Kim Kelly and Philip Drake. Philip Drake is running for president right now. He's running as independent for president of the United States. And he was a federal, he worked for the federal government. And he's calling out all the, like, they traffic children. They take part in bribery. They are 100% behind all of this. And he's calling them out on it. <laughs> I would love to speak with an independent candidate who could, because... I know how to talk. I know how to present. I know how to do research. And I got the backing. Yeah. Yeah. I would love to tell you all the stuff I found out about how. Oh, oh my gosh, we could talk so much. So I put <laughs> out with my research and stuff. Okay. Yeah, we can all work together. This is going to be fantastic. So I will let you go, but thank you so much. You always so much. Thank you for joining me. It was a pleasure to talk with you. <laughs> all right. Have a great day. You too.